Christmas. Merry Christmas. It's a good day. <laughs> yes, it is. It's so good. Even with dry or with milk or with dried fruit. It's just really the king of cereals. It is. You know what I was thinking about just now, though? Here's what I would, here's what I'm considering. I'll let you know later this next week if I do it. You see how each one has a little hole? What would happen if you uh -huh. like line, line them up on a cookie sheet and put one little piece of chocolate inside there and then just melt it for like 20 seconds and then let it reset like a like one chocolate chip on each one see what i mean and then and then just let it harden again i think it would need i think it would need two chocolate chips <laughs> to fill the hole oh i don't know i think one might do it and then you know the ones like maybe this. one the ones like this, you just have to eat those. Those go in your cereal bowl. Yeah. Yeah. It's a I like cereal. that idea. Yeah. So it's Christmas mm. Day. So Merry Christmas if you're people that celebrate. And if you Merry don't, Christmas. if you don't, happy Sunday. Happy Crackling Oprah and Day. <laughs> there you go. I wonder <laughs> if I wrote them. And explained all of this if they would create Cracklin Oat Brand Day. Who is they? Make it official. Who Who is they? Who would you write to? <laughs> we wait while Ann chooses. Oh, but are they in charge of the National Day of blank? I mean, who's in charge? Well, see, there's nationaltoday.com. Okay. Which is where I go to do all my, find my holidays. Because I do work in progress Wednesday. Right. And finish object Friday on my Facebook group. And the finish object Friday, I always say what national day it is. Oh, maybe, maybe they're the people you need to write to. And yeah. Like some of them are totally made up. Like they have the history of what the national day was. And it's like, Bob really liked pennies and so he made this penny day well then that would be appropriate for, for cr crackling oat brand day christmas is crackling mm -hmm. oat brand day so but let me just acknowledge if you don't yeah. talk about christmas or if christmas is hard for you and the holidays are rough for some you know what it's okay grab your knitting get a blankie watch a movie have some hot chocolate have a self-care day it's fun like put lotion on your feet it's okay <laughs> don't spit your cereal <laughs> i don't know you're glitchy and delayed so i don't know what was funny there <laughs> and now you <laughs> the, the put put the lotion on your feet i don't know why that made me laugh but it did but it's like a self-care thing you know yeah because yeah. do i take time to put lotion on my cracked and dry feet usually not but i should Hey, this is about Cracklin' Oat Brand today, not Cracked and Dried Feet. But if you need to make it about Cracked and Dried Feet, that's fine. No, no, I'm just saying let's have you some, do you. I'm just saying let's have some self-care. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all. So, yeah, knitting is good. Watching movies is good. Yeah. I poured too much cereal in my bowl. That Someone is else. one drawback with Cracklin Oat Brand. It is extremely filling. Well, it's brand. So Christmas, Christmas, Christmas is, uh, yeah, I'm really unprepared. But it, you know what? It's okay. My, It's not like my kids are little and they're unprepared as well. And my husband got called out. So. Yeah. It, it's just fine. enjoy the family time. Right. You know, so, with the kids. Yeah. And the fact that everybody's home and we started a jigsaw. We started started a puzzle last night on the big table. Nice. And it's it. It kind of was difficult because the pieces are not your regular. This one's vertical and this one's horizontal. They're like all kind of weird shaped. And some of them are like, yeah. like diagonal. And yeah. Nice. So, yeah, that's fun. The I get advent calendars for everybody for Christmas. Oh. 
And the one I was most proud of finding was one that was a puzzle advent for my oldest child who loves puzzles. Yes. So every day you get, I forget how many pieces it is. I mean, it's a thousand piece puzzle, I want to say by the end. Okay. So divide that by 24. So you get that many pieces every day and it does like a little square of the puzzle. So you build, you know. Yeah. So you get like 25 pieces. You get like 25 pieces every day. Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever. Whatever. Whatever the math works out to be. Math is hard. We established that. Yes. That's neat. neat Yeah. I've never seen one before. No. I kind of want to do that. Do you remember the company where you got that? I was thinking. Uh, No. I got it on Amazon. So I just searched for advent calendars and that was one that came up. But there were like different ones, you know, and hers is like, or theirs is like a Christmas scene. Mm -hmm. Um, And as you do it, you see more things like, so, you know, cause the box is smaller than the Mm -hmm. puzzle itself. And so we were discovering like there's cats all over in this Christmas scene that you don't really notice on the box cover. So that was kind of fun. So, you know, yeah. I mean, does the box cover... Like, you know what the whole thing's going to look like in the end or not? Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. They should. They yeah. should. It's not a mystery one. Oh, it, they should yeah. do mystery ones. I kind of did look around to see if there was a mystery one as I was doing, you know, as I was looking for them, but I didn't see one. So hmm. they just so, got a Christmas one. That's fun. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I was kind of glad I found this one. It, this puzzle has, was still in the wrapper and it was in the depths of the game closet. And. <sighs> We hadn't built it before. So that's kind of fun. It's a Christmas one. Nice. And we we cleaned out our puzzle and game closet a couple of years ago. So we didn't really have a lot of puzzles left, you know? Uh-uh. So that was a, a good find last night. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, we have one coming. Uh, well, today when this airs, <laughs> one will be revealed. So I think we'll end up working on that yes. for part of the day. Like it. Yeah. So nice, nice. Tetris. There will be a Tetris marathon. Love that. I think what I was telling you earlier, or what I was gonna tell you, we were having technical problems. There comes a tipping point, you know, in your relationship with your kids where when their kids are little, like you just kind of like mom wins all the games because because you know, because you know what's happening and you've had that experience. Mm-hmm. And I used to always just beat the pants off them with Tetris. And we have the old school Tetris, like on the Super Nintendo with the cartridges. And so you can choose yeah. your level. So you can play against each other, but like one person could be level five where the other person's playing level seven. Okay, I see. Where you're still competing head to head, but like one person could have a little easier time of it. And the other person is level, you know, several levels up or whatever you decide is equitable. So uh-huh. when the kids were little, they'd be like on level three and I'd be like on level nine. Well, now <laughs> I have to play level five or six and she plays level seven. Oh, I still get trash. The turn tables of turn table. The turning tables of time. I'm just saying I might not be quite as quick as I used to be. And of course, now she's like sharp. She just whips. I mean, I just get thrashed. Yeah, but it's still fun. Super fun. That is fun. I love Tetris. I do too. Fun. I haven't played that game in a long time. Oh, it's serious. <gasps> so it's serious. So I don't know I what we're to... gonna do for Christmas. Hmm. Because uh yeah, we talked about games and stuff, and we and we decided not to get a new game this year. We're just gonna play our old games. Yeah. And there's a puzzle and I expect we'll watch a show or two and, but we have just a very low key Christmas planned. That's good. Of, in so much as we have not actually articulated plans. <laughs> and that's okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's fine. It's, I'm like really looking forward to it, to be honest. Well, yeah. And we decided, you know, we, we'd already talked about the pot roast thing that we're, we did Christmas Eve mm-hmm. and and then Christmas morning is pecan sticky buns unless my husband gets called out. So that'll we'll see. Right. Because we're pre-recording this. But then the rest of the day we're just just gonna hang out. Yeah. And not go right. anywhere. And that's good. That's like good. This 
That's yeah. the point. And that and that's the thing is we don't even get all like into the gifts and stuff really anymore. It's just about hanging out together and you know, let's make nachos and do the puzzle, you know, <laughs> just yeah. Yeah. That's nice. really good, actually. Nachos. Nachos. Well, should we open our yarns? Yes, let's do. Go ahead. I'm knitting. Okay. Day 25. It's a yarn. It's a squishy one. Ta-da! It's Easter ooh. Ooh. Oh, now I see that. Okay. Nice. So it's like a tanny natural. Fine. So this one, oh. so all the other ones had like this label on it with the color and information, but this one, so this one today, you should have like a full label that okay. tells you all about the company and everything. So oh, nice. nice. Make sure you store them all together, which you should do anyway. Tomorrow we get the pattern and Ooh. I'm excited about it. So I'm excited about it. It's true. The lovely ladies at Mackenzie's farm stand. Okay. Okay, so mine today is it's two sheepies. Yes, there we go. I know who the company is, so I'm gonna guess New York State. <laughs> yeah. So I remember who we interviewed. So yeah, this is from Hudson, Hudson and West, and the name of their company yes. is representative of where they are. One of the partners is in the um, Hudson River Valley in upstate New York and the other is the part of West is in San Francisco so we interviewed right. Sloan Rosenthal she's the western half of that company so we have her interview coming up today and this is a oh skein of yarn is that black then, or navy or dark brown black no it's black okay and I'm reading on here this is called the name of it is called weld Mm. And it is 70% U.S. Merino, 30% U.S. Corydale. Okay. 200 yards from Hudson and West. So, and this is called Raven. Nice. Yes, it is black, black. Black. And uh, yeah, so this is designed to be the con or coordinating color for all of those minis. Right. And the pattern will be revealed in a couple of days yes so stay tuned very nice yes what well, feels nice no no yeah. nylon merino and corydale yeah that is nice all right so we'll cut over to that interview and i'll see okay. you tomorrow merry christmas everybody Bye. Bye. hey everyone we're here with sloan rosenthal sloan and her friend megan started hudson and west company to bring american-made yarns and modern wearable designs to hand knitters thank you so much sloan for joining us thanks so much for having me would you mind starting by sharing how you and megan connected and decided to start a yarn company together yeah, I, I, that's a fair question. Many people have asked. Um, it's a fun story. So I, um, I'm a lawyer by trade and training. And I started knitting after my daughter was born. And uh, then I started designing a little bit because I was like a serial tinkerer. And Megan... Uh, yeah, well... A serial a tinker. We have to acknowledge that serial tinker. Yes. Uh, so then I started designing and Megan was at interweave knits. She was the editor in chief there. And she actually hired me for my first like third party published design, which was a sweater called tangled up in gray. And, um, which in retrospect was like a great sweater, but not a great magazine sweater. Cause it was like much too complicated for the layout. So I learned a lot from that experience, but I got to know Megan pretty well. And, um, a couple years, we did a few more projects together. And then a couple years later at Rhinebeck, um, we were both talking to the same mill about doing some yarn projects. I'm thinking about kind of what might be next because she had left interweave and I was on a leave of absence from my law firm. And we were talking about kind of, you know, what um, what might be the right full-time gig in the industry because um, being a freelance pattern designer is usually not for most people. And uh, we were both talking to Mary Jean Packer at Batten Kill 
about spinning some yarn. And MJ said, you guys are friends and I don't really want to be involved in the business end of this. So why don't you guys work together? Um, so we traded sample skeins of the things we were thinking of. And um, both of us decided we really liked the other's kind of idea and approach. And critically, I think we had the same underlying goal about what kind of yarn we wanted to make and about what we wanted kind of the point of the exercise to be. Mm -hmm. So we started working together and then over the next really nine months, which is not that long in retrospect, um, got the yarn, you know, first batches of yarn made, got the first collection designed and we launched the following November. Wow. So that was a whirlwind. Um, yeah. But we both really had the same kind of, and we'll talk, I know you have questions about kind of design philosophy later, but we, we really had the same concept at the beginning, which made the collaboration really seamless, um, which is both of us really wanted to make uh, yarn that could make clothes you could wear everywhere, right? We always talk about um, clothes, not knitting projects, right? And and the idea of making things that are are wearable and functional and that that get, as my kids would say, the, oh my gosh, you made your sweater, not the, oh, you made your sweater reaction. <laughs> um, I have an 11 year old daughter who's old enough to like snark about things. So I have, uh, the subtleties of, of tone and, and sarcasm. Oh, that's prime. That's prime yeah. preteen snark age. Yep. Wow. No, it's right in there. So, uh, mm -hmm. so we talk about, yeah, kind of the, the like, oh my gosh, you made that kind of vibe being what we're going for. And it helps that we both love cabled sweaters. Obviously we have, we have done a lot of cabled sweaters in, in mm -hmm. Forge, which we, it had to be a yarn that made good cabled sweaters. That was one of the requirements. <laughs> but we kind of, we came at it from the same, you know, fundamentals, which then made figuring out exactly what it was going to look like and exactly what it was going to be right. really easy. Um, well, you mentioned, you just mentioned one of your yarns called Forge. Mm -hmm. So, and so tell us what makes that good for cabled sweaters and, you know, tell us about your yarn, the various ones you have, because I am picky when it comes to like stitch definition and, you know, cable sweater, sweater worthy yarn. That's a good point. Yes. Yeah. So we make two yarns called Forge and Weld, um, and both of them are the same Merino Corydale blend. Okay. And so it's 70% Merino, 30% Corydale, all made in the U.S. from sheep to skein. Mm -hmm. Um, and Fantastic. you know, Merino handles like Merino, everybody knows what a Merino yarn feels like. Basically the Corydale is a medium wool. Um, and when I teach about, I teach a class called speed dating your yarn a lot, where I talk to people about kind of the material science of, of knitting and why it matters, what you pick for your things. Corydale, like if you looked at pictures of sheep, it's a medium wool. So it's somewhere in between the kind of like fluffy brillo pad explosion of a merino sheep and the like long curly hair of something like a lester long wool or something like that yeah. and what it gives you is a slightly longer staple length which gives you more durability but not a big sacrifice in softness oh. so we categorize fibers by um by width by micron count and by staple length and in general longer staples are more give you more durability because it's fewer fiber ends poking out into your yarn um, but they tend to be a little bit thicker in diameter, which we tend to feel more in our skin. So we use a, a fine grade Corydale, which gives us that extra durability, but without sacrificing much in the way of softness. And then the other thing that Cory does is as it, you know, when you dye two fibers together, even if they're both wool, they're going to take up the dye a little bit differently. So it gives us a little extra dimensionality, even in the super saturated solid colors. So it's a domestic Merino Corydale blend. We used to buy from individual farms. We now buy comb top from a broker because we're at large enough scale that I terrified every Corydale farmer in the Northeast trying to share their sheep too many times. So we can't buy from individual <laughs> farms anymore. I wish we could, but, um, and then now it's spun at Mountain Meadow in Buffalo, Wyoming, just North of you. Mm -hmm. um, not really just, there's no just. <laughs> in well, Wyoming, North of you, but. <laughs> Yeah, it's four hours. Yeah. Yeah. Same side of the state. Right. Sure. Um, so we spin at Mountain Meadow and then it gets dyed at Ultimate Textile in North Carolina. And wow, the so there's that, a lot of back and forthing with all that. There is, which is hard. We used to have an all East Coast based supply chain, but um, we sort of outgrew Batten Kills manufacturing capacity and their business model because they're really geared towards small farmers. Okay. Um, and we don't want to crowd those folks out either. So Mountain Meadow is aimed at a little more of the kind of one to 10,000 pound spin lots, which is a great fit for us. Okay. Um, but both mills use 
something that's really special to us, which is a semi-worsted spinning model. Okay. So minor digression on worsted and woolen spun yarns. I have curly hair, so I use that as an analogy. Well, go ahead, because um, a lot of people, a lot of our viewers may not know that. Yeah, a lot of people yeah so know. we have two different kind of major spinning systems. There's worsted spun and woolen spun. Worsted spun, the analogy that I use is like, if I blow dried my hair and I like combed it all straight and I got all the fibers going in one direction, that's a worsted spun yarn. It's smooth. It's usually quite round. The stitch definition is great. It's very clear. But when you block it, the stitches don't like whoosh into each other. They don't form, they don't tend to want to form a cohesive fabric. And this is doubly true if you're talking about a super wash, but like a multiply worsted spun yarn, the stitches are going to stand proud of each other, okay. right? Because there's just not as many fibers poking out right. to felt into each other a little bit when you block, which is, is what happens when you block your sweater. Um, a woolen spun yarn is the, the scrunch and pray method of dealing with your hair, right? Is the, like, I got out of the shower and I just flipped it over and I went, eh, and then I walked away. Right. Um, and the fibers are not combed in the same direction at all. And so you have fiber ends going in all kinds of directions. And that gives you a lot of loft and a lot of kind of woolly lightness. It can also produce a slightly scratchier feeling just because there's more fibers coming out. Right. Um, and then also you get those, you know, if you knit those yarns at a tight gauge, you get a very cohesive fabric and they can get a little bulletproof when you block them. Right. Semi-worsted is the, I brushed it and then I scrunched it up a little bit, right? Or kind of the, I let it mostly go. So the fibers are combed a little bit in the same direction, but not to the extent of a worsted spun yarn. Okay. So you get a really nice balance between roundness and stitch definition and fluffy fabric cohesion, oh, right? Yeah. And if you, if you think about, you know, when you buy sweaters, if you go to a store that sells nice sweaters, not acrylic, cotton blend, you know, whatever, but like nice wool sweaters, you'll see that the ready to wear sweaters you're drawn to, I bet as a knitter, are the ones that have a fabric where the stitches kind of cohere and you can see them, but it still looks like a smooth, cohesive piece of fabric. Interesting. Um, we don't tend to see in the ready to wear world a lot of sweaters where the stitches stand really proud of one another, where they kind of tend to pull away. Right. Um, and so we were, the, the semi-worsted gives you a little more of that kind of ready to wear inspired vibe that we were going for. And again, it, it keeps, if you're making a cabled sweater, cabled sweaters are dense, right? They're heavy. It's a lot of knitting. Um, if you make it in, you know, something like, a super a, a four ply, super tight twist, super wash merino that's got a ton of spring to it. Like A, the sweater's gonna weigh a ton, right? And B, those stitches are gonna wanna pull away from each other, not towards each other. So it's gonna grow over time, right? right. And it's just gonna feel heavy in a way that isn't always pleasant to wear. Mm -hmm. We use a three ply, which gives you like enough stitch definition, but not, the cables are not sky high, but if you make them on slightly, you know, if you make it on slightly larger needles, you can block it into a really nice, uh, like drapey fabric that you want to wear. So that's what we think kind of makes it cabled sweater worthy. Um, I'm wearing a sweater and weld now, uh, hilariously, even though 99% of what I do is cabled sweaters. This is a color work sweater that I did, but it's because it has an interesting yoke for Zoom. So I wear it when I teach all the time. <laughs> Sure, sure. <laughs> um, but weld is great for color work. Weld is our fingering weight. It's like a heavy fingering and forges a light worsted. Weld okay. works great for color work. It's lovely for stockinette sweaters. It can do cables. I tend to find the gauge at which you need to knit it to get the cables to really pop is not a gauge at which I enjoy knitting sweaters. Okay. Because it's just a lot of knitting, but it makes like wonderful textured sweaters and, you know, simple stockinette sweaters. And many of my most worn garments are those kinds of things in weld. Right. right. Um, but I think Forge really shines as a, as a, a cabled garment yarn that gives you again, that really nice balance of lightness and stitch definition and wearability. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Awesome. So you mentioned you're wearing a color work sweater and I will point out mm -hmm. that you have amazing pattern support on the website like a lot of yarn producers they'll have you know five to ten patterns yeah you can scroll and scroll through the patterns 
that have been designed using your yarn. And um, there is quite a bit of color work for those of you who like enjoy color work a little more than Erin. I think I'm about, I'm pretty split between cables and color work myself. Yeah. I like doing both. Um, but yeah, I wonder if, um, if you, cause you've already talked a little bit about your design philosophy, which I totally appreciate because there is a difference between something that's fun to knit mm -hmm. and something that's practical to wear or stylish to wear. And sometimes there's overlap, but not always. Yeah. And I'm, I'm looking at your styles here and they're interesting. And like, I could see myself wearing any of these now or 10 years ago, you know, yeah. like they just have that classic yeah uh design sort of elements to them and I wonder where are all these designs coming from and uh you know and how um how where are you getting the inspiration for these yeah well we um first of all thank you yeah we um one of the perks of working with someone who used to be a magazine editor is like she's amazing at coming up with the visions for our collections and at doing mm -hmm. um you know, really well-produced photo shoots and all kinds of things that as an indie designer, I just had no experience with. So I am super grateful for, you know, Megan's expertise on, on those, those fronts. I think, you know, in terms of, we did, we did do a couple of all color work collections um, to try to kind of push ourselves in that direction, which I think has been really fun. Mm -hmm. I think both of us get a lot of inspiration from both kind of the history of knitwear um, which is why you see a lot of kind of modern takes on classic Aaron sweaters. And then also right. just from like looking at what's cool and ready to wear sweaters and trying to figure out, you know, yeah. how could I make that? Or how could I make something like that? Right. We try mm -hmm. to within reason, um, you know, follow trends a little bit in terms of silhouette, both in terms of what people are knitting and also what people are, what you can, can buy in real life. Um, cause again, we want these to be things that fit into people's wardrobes. So if you've bought all right. high-waisted pants, cause you want to wear crop sweaters, like we want to serve that customer. Um, right. although man, pants have gotten really high lately. Eighties, yeah. <laughs> just saying eighties somewhere. Um, so, you know, I think we try to be, we try to find a balance between, um, things that are, that have that current feel, but also have those kind of classic knitterly techniques. I think we're also, you know, uh, we have some people in the, in the world of cable design who inspire us a lot. Megan loves Annie Maloney. Um, I'm a big Nora Gon fan. You know, we have kind of, you can see those takeoff points in sure. the work, right. Of kind of things that we've been inspired by. Um, so yeah, I think we just kind of, I, you know, are there some, nature inspired motifs maybe, but a lot of what we, what we end up being drawn to is, you know, what do we see people wearing and what do we, what kind of, what do we want to wear? Right. Um, so, and I am, you know, I live out here in Boulder. I work on a farm when I'm not doing this. Um, so I tend to be very like, there's a lot of jeans and a lot of boots and a lot of practical. like very <laughs> practical seeming things, right? Yeah, um, and it's cold in Boulder. It is, it gets cold, it snowed today. I am not happy with it being winter this early, um, you know, <laughs> uh, and and Megan spends, a, she lives in upstate New York, but has a lot more of that kind of like East Coast prep vibe that you see in a lot of the sweaters that she does. So, yeah. um, and then she has this amazing menswear background which has been an awesome thing to add to the brand. Um, in the way that the cobbler's children have no shoes, I've never made my husband a sweater, um, <laughs> ever. I made him some hats. Um, we have some hat patterns that originated as hats for Dave's, but Dave, but I have not made him a sweater, but Megan is great at menswear, which is an awesome thing to kind of have in the, in the quiver that I think a lot of peer brands don't, so. So I'm sure you're aware that lots of knitters binge TV shows and we have audiobooks and we're always looking for new suggestions for the Netflix list. Yeah. So what do you have any recommendations and have you watched anything recently that you thought was awesome knitting Netflix? Awesome knitting Netflix. Or, um, you know, Amazon Prime or whatever. But yeah, I have, no, a, so I have my, an ongoing list. The one thing, I mean, I, I did botch the lace in a shawl watching outlander once um i oops so it's the jamie <laughs> fraser memorial like lace 
mess up in this shawl that I made. <laughs> I did. I can't go back and fix lace. That's beyond me. So um, no, my family has been my. We do a little like if the kids are you know if life is peaceful in the evening, we'll try to watch a show together. So we just finished watching the last season of The Dragon Prince, which is highly knitable and fun for like the whole crew. Yeah. Um, and then now we're watching a show called Blown Away, which is like a glass blowing. Oh, I, that's cool. Yeah. Mom yeah. yeah. like, and I were watching that. Yeah, it makes, I mean, I'm now amazed that like any glass products are ever sold and finished given how many things break. I know. On that show. <laughs> um, it's but, a cool show. Yeah, so that's kind of neat. We've been watching that. And then um, we watched House of the Dragon, which I barely knit through, but I managed to knit through most of. Um, and then I'm a big podcast person. Okay. So um, I, and I am a fantasy geek as I have just, outed myself at so um my favorite podcast ever is a podcast <laughs> called binge mode which uh i love dearly which started out as a game of thrones thing and then has now expanded to a whole bunch of other um fantasy related properties um and then a podcast called kin folklore that two of my like dearest friends uh do and so i have done a lot of like listening to podcasts while i knit sure um and and that tends to be especially if i'm like flying and stuff that tends yeah. to be good yeah Good thing. Those are great recommendations. Thank you for that. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, thanks. Do you have anything coming up in the new year for the company that you're able to maybe give us a little preview of? Yeah, so we've been doing, and this is probably of, of particular interest, I think, to the Indie Untangled audience because we have lots of Indie Dyer fans, but we've been doing um, this Hudson and West and Friends series, which is patterns that pair our yarns with some of our favorite yarn makers and dyers. Um, we have noticed when we looked one of the, yeah, one of the cool things about Ravelry is you can see what people are actually doing with the yarn. And we noticed there's a lot of like weld and mohair and weld and spin cycle kind of stuff going on. So we have a series of patterns that will come out over the next few months that feature those yarns held together. Um, oh. yeah. And we, you know, we picked that. some of our favorite like silk mohair lace weights, but, uh, obviously you can choose your own. They're all, you know, whatever color. Yeah, yeah. Floats the boat. So, and those range from being some very simple designs to some that are a little more complex and textured, but that's been a really fun way to explore like a new thing that the yarn can do. Yeah. Um, that, that is, and some things that are maybe a little bit outside the wheelhouse of like stuff Megan and I would normally do. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are, we are doing that. And then, um, you know, we have done the past few years, we've done three big seasonal collections. This year we've had, we have one big fall collection that we did right before Rhinebeck. And then we'll have things that come out in series over the course of the rest of the year. Okay. So it'll be more kind of one-off drops. Um, right now we are in the midst of our hats for all campaign series um, of patterns, which we love knitting hats. I, every year I come home from Rhinebeck and I knit a ton of hats because I've like done my big sweaters for the fall and then I don't, and it's busy and like, I don't want to knit a sweater right now. I want to make a hat. So um, we now, instead of just like me making lots of hats, we now have a series of hat patterns that comes out November and December every year for other people like me who like to knit hats this time of year. <laughs> so those are coming out kind of every other Wednesday from now for the next little bit. Um, nice. So you can find those on Instagram and on our website. Um, and we are big on single skein hats. If it's, if it's worsted weight, it's going to be a single skein hat. Or like I had a very stern conversation with somebody about why it needed to be two. Um, and one time that stern conversation had to be with myself because <laughs> we want to make it <laughs> easy for people to um, to knit those or to give them as gift projects too. Yeah, that's right. neat. Yeah. Yeah, hats are perfect last minute holiday gifts. Yeah. I always, I always think I'm never, you know, I'm going to do my holiday knitting and I'm going to be done. And then it'll be like a week or two before and I'll be like, oh, I forgot this person. Oh, I should do it for that person. And then I so I'm just knitting till the end. Yep. <laughs> no, and hats are also like hats are an awesome way to try out a new technique. Yeah, for you sure. Know, or experiment with. So I just finished a set of like hats using, you know, have you read the sequence knitting book by Cecilia Campuchero from I, ago? Yes. Well, just in in the bookshop but yeah. i haven't actually taken it home with me yet yeah so yeah. um i used to live near cecilia in um in silicon valley but okay. she uh wrote this book about kind of different ways of patterns that basically emerge from just knitting the same thing over and over again not like okay and then you come back to the next row and you do it so i knit a hat with one of these 
sequencing patterns in weld and spin cycle. And it was like really fun and it was super soothing. And it was like, oh, I hadn't done a non-cable pad in a really long time. And it was cool to just play with a new way to think about the yarn. Mm -hmm. So hats are great for stuff like that because it's like not a huge commitment. You're like, I'm going to work on this for a week and then it'll be done. Right. Um, and that's a good way to a good way to play with kind of different ideas. So. Sloan, thanks so much for joining us on the yeah, podcast. Thank you guys so much. That's yeah, wonderful. Sloan, great to meet you. Thank you. Yeah, great meeting you guys.